everybody, and welcome to our Leading Through Change webinar. Last summer, um, all network development grantees were asked to complete our annual network technical assistance development assessment. Um, and this assessment asks questions related to the future sustainability of your network and your project, such as the extent to which your members are involved in decisions, and whether your evaluation results are communicated with stakeholders on a regular basis. Another part of this assessment collected input from all of you on the TA topics you were most interested in gaining experience or knowledge on during this year, which was is kind of from the fall of 2018 through the fall of 2019. That's the year that we're considering here. And that assessment listed 40 topics, from financial forecasting to expanding care coordination to creating a culture of innovation and a lot of other topics. And this slide shows the top five, well, actually the top six, because you'll see there's a tie here. Um, the, so the top six topics identified by all of you. We've got understanding the role of networks in population health, promoting success to key stakeholders, data analytics and dashboards, leading change, which is our topic for the day. And then there was a tie between measuring collaborative relationships and product and service development. And as we planned this year of TA, we kept this input from you on from this assessment front and center. We've built discussions and we've built education about understanding the role of networks and population health into a lot of our TA activities this year, into workshops and summits and some conversations that, into check-in calls related to that topic. Then promoting success to key stakeholders and data, data analytics and dashboards were the focus of the balance scorecard of the evaluation workshop, which was held in Duluth, Minnesota last fall. And the materials from this workshop are on our website. We, we had a tie for fifth, we'll skip over leading change for a minute, but we had a tie for fifth with measuring collaborative relationships, which will be addressed during the collaboration workshop that will be held in Duluth this coming August, and product and service development, which was addressed in marketing webinars and toolkits, as well as the product and service business planning workshop that was held in Florida in March, and the toolkits which you all have access to as you begin to develop your business plan. So we'll be addressing the topic of leading change during discussions in our collaboration workshop in Duluth in August, but we wanted to use this particular webinar as an opportunity to kind of take a deep dive specifically into the topic of leading change. And really, when you think about it, the whole point of a network development grant is to drive change. Here on this slide are the three statutory charges that HRSA puts in front of network development grantees. In order to receive a network development grant, as you all know, the goal of, of a project had to be at least one of these three things. And really, all of these are about change. They're about changing the way people do things, changing the way people look at things. And very often, this involves a wide spectrum of kind of levels of change, from the legislative, the big picture legislative, regulatory policy level, all the way down to the personal level, the way people interact with even one individual patient. And so it makes sense that change is a high priority for all of you as a group. Leading not only others, but also yourself through the experience of change is really one of the most complex and challenging things we can do in our professional and in our personal life. But the good news is that as a group, you already have quite a track record of successfully leading groups and yourselves through change. Here are, you know, I've been, I kind of went back through notes from recent check-in calls um, to get some examples. And here are some of the things that we've heard from, di from different ones of you over the last couple months of check-in calls. So you've done things like implementing processes for physicians to refer patients to, to social service support resources influencing diabetes patients to change behavior, incorporating community health workers into, into processes, systems for sharing data, convincing providers and staff to use a health information exchange, um, and more. So that we've got groups who have been integrating behavioral health screening and, and behavioral health services into primary care. There have been a lot of changes with coding processes to, to improve reimbursement for for critical care and transitional care programs, persuading behavioral health providers to use telehealth for patient encounters, and really changing, this is a, kind of a big picture change, but changing perspectives of network members so that the network sees itself as part of the bigger population health picture. These are all really complex changes. 
So we know that there's a lot of knowledge in this group already, and I encourage you even after the grant period is over to stay connected with each other and call on each other as resources because as you all probably know, some of the best advice you can ever get comes from people who kind of been where you are and work through some of the same issues you're working through. We also know there are more changes to come for this group. So this slide shows just a handful of examples of some of the things we know you're already working on. So we've got transportation services, using having an entire group use the same social determinant screening tool. There's a lot, there are a lot of networks working on um, figuring out dues structures with the end of the grant period coming up. There's been a lot of services that have been supported with grant money, and now it's time to get um, members to support those in the long term. Um, ensuring that patient engagement with programs after enrollment, we've got work floors, we've got workflows, we have new technology and, and new mindset. So there are a lot of things coming up. And in addition, we also know just because of the, the time frame that we're in with the three-year grant period, we know that you're just kind of generally facing new things that go along with this part of the grant period. So maintaining all of the things that have been supported by the grant into the future. There may be organizational structure or reporting relationships that might be changing. Maybe looking at different funding streams um, once the three years is over. And your own job might look different. So we know there's a lot. This is kind of the peak of the change time in a um, sea of change that you're usually leading and encountering as a network, the network leader. But at this point in the grant period, we just kind of thought, because of where we are, we thought it might be helpful to share some insights and some strategies for managing through all these changes. So here are our learning objectives for today. And I like to think of them in the form of questions we'll answer. So here are the questions that we'll answer. Why do people react differently to change? How can we help others navigate through the change process? And then how can we manage our own emotions during the change process? We're really going to kind of focus on the experience of change and how to help yourself and others through it as it's happening, rather than kind of formal steps to follow ahead of time. Not that there isn't value in it. There are a lot of value. There's a lot of value in following kind of a standardized process for, for moving through change. But the focus for today is really on the experience of change. And we'll walk through a few things to think about and a few tools that you can use when you run into challenges. In their book, Switch, which is about managing change, Chip and Dan Heath make a, a great analogy. They say that whenever we're experiencing or driving change, our brains are really operating on two levels, the rational and the emotional. They, they liken the rational side to a rider, so creating a plan, um, methodically directing activities toward the end goal. There's our rider. Um, so that the rider is the rational side. And a lot of literature on managing change focuses on this rational side, or the rider, the planning the initiative, identifying my, milestones, identifying potential roadblocks, and ways to prevent those road, roadblocks. And those are very valid things to be focusing on. But what's often overlooked is the emotional side, or in this analogy we're using today, the elephant. If you think about it, change is a really emotional process. If you think about the, the changes you've been part of, you might have undergone big changes like career transitions or a change in residence, um, implementing a new software system, getting a new boss, moving offices. There's, there's the logical, rational side that tells you the change makes sense or doesn't make sense, and, and it might help you lay out a plan for carrying out the change. But then there's the emotional side, kind of having to get out of your comfort zone, having to live with uncertainty and doubt possibly second-guessing whether you made the right decision. All of those are emotions. That's, that's your, your kind of your elephant side during change. And if you look at this picture, the rider kind of looks like he's in charge, but he's pretty small compared to the elephant. And if there's disagreement between those two, the elephant is going to win every time. And really, that's the same thing that happens when the rational and emotional parts of your brain are in conflict. The emotional side wins almost every time. So in our conversation today, we're certainly not going to ignore that rider. We're, we'll talk about the importance of things like having a good reason for initiating the change and having clear goals. But we're really going to zero in on the elephant or the emotional side. We, 
you can't successfully lead any change initiative without having a good understanding of other people's emotions as well as our own. And when change efforts fail, sometimes it can be due to um, a problem with planning or some unforeseen circumstances. But very often it's due to the elephant, whether it's our own elephant or other people's elephants. Um, but then, but the good thing is it's the elephant who also gets things done. It's our emotions that keep us kind of carrying forward and moving through, moving forward through challenges. So that elephant is a critical piece. Sorry, I'm stuck for one more minute. There we go. There, there is a growing body of research about the impact that emotions can have on a lot of processes that we've historically thought of as rational. For, for example, there's been some recent research that found that providers' emotions can impact clinical decisions. There's one example here on this slide. There's, there's also been a lot of research in the past decade or so on the role that emotions play in our economic decisions. And we're learning that when it comes to money, we're not quite the rational beings that early economists thought we were. There's been a really, there was a really interesting study done recently that found that not only will bad feelings affect how much we'll pay for something, but different bad feelings mean we'll pay different amounts. So we're getting a little bit more detailed understanding of the spectrum of emotions and the impact that those have on our behavior. And then there was another study where nurses participating in a shared governance initiative kind of picked up on and adopted emotions from their colleagues. So pleasantness or unpleasantness or a, a feeling of being motivated versus demotivated. demotivated. And that impacted their perceptions of the, the benefits or the legitimacy of this, this initiative and their willingness to participate in it and implement it. So we can pick up emotions up from other people and that can have an impact on our behavior as well. So let's, let's look for just a minute at the emotions people often experience over the course of a change. So here we've got the change curve. This curve might look familiar to you. It follows the consecutive stages of grief that were identified by Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in the 1960s. So this has been around for a long time and a lot of you have probably seen this before. And there's been a lot of research conducted since then that supports the idea that this, this very same pattern shows up in the emotions we experience during change. And those stages are denial, so kind of shock or feeling overwhelmed or potentially a feeling that it may not affect me personally or it may not happen at all. And then there's anger, which kind of comes out as the underlying pain that sometimes comes out in negative ways toward others. We'll talk a little bit more about what each of these looks like in a minute, but this is just to kind of get, get the big picture context. There's bargaining, which really comes out in the form of negotiation. So maybe if I do this, this might work for me. There's depression, which, which um, in this context, we're not, really, we're not talking about clinical depression here, just kind of this feeling of emptiness, specifically in the context of the change. And the, the end of the change curve is a feeling of acceptance, of a kind of acceptance of a change reality, that the new reality really is the permanent, or as permanent as things can be in this environment, the permanent reality. There's an interesting piece at the bottom of this curve that some people call the trapdoor of despair. Um, sometimes at this point of the curve, so when somebody is experiencing a change, it becomes so hard to deal with the change that people just drop out. And in this context, they might mean they quit their job or they ask for a reassignment. They just want out of the whole, the whole process. If you've been through a really difficult change at work before, you might recognize this trap door. You may have considered leaving your job or you may actually have done it. Um, the, the, this process, this change curve process, isn't always quite this neat or quite so well defined. And, Studies have found that we can move backwards on the curve as well. It's not just this nice, neat forward progression. Um, but as you're going through a change and supporting yourself and others as things progress, it can be helpful to remember that change actually involves grief. So there's a letting go of the past. There's an accepting of a new reality. In that, this happens even when a change is positive. So even imagine winning the lottery. There's still a process of letting go of the past and adjusting to a new reality.
There was a really interesting study done um, a couple years ago by Anne Shepek McAlerney, who's on the faculty of the medical school at Ohio State. And she had a, a lot of other team members, which you can see in our references. But in this study, they looked at the process of implementing an electronic health record at six different health systems across the United States. And in particular, they looked at the emotional experiences of physicians throughout the implementation. And as in the process of the study, they held focus groups with physicians. And from the focus group data, they saw this very curve, this, this change curve, um, in the pattern of experiences described by the physicians. Let's look at a couple of examples. In the write-up of the study, they include comments made by physicians illustrating every one of these stages along the curve. So here's one example of denial. Here was a quote um, from someone they would classify in the denial stage. You see words like unsettling, um, sometimes um, uncomfortable. There's a lot of kind of negative language with denial. Anger showed up. Um, and you, you may be looking at this quote thinking, well, sometimes this is true, that when, when you, you're implementing some new software, you're spending a lot of extra time doing it. It doesn't mean that these aren't true, um, but these are just the, some of the kind of things, that, the comments that can come up during these stages. So here's a quote illustrating anger. Bargaining showed up. So could I just put a progress note rather than a cover letter? They even found depression, um, including the trap door of despair. So the first two weeks, I could have, I could have quit medicine. And, and a lot of you probably know there's a, there are a lot of providers right now who are either considering or are actively in the process of changing fields because of this particular type of change is so difficult. And there were comments illustrating acceptance, such as the one here on the screen. So you might be looking at this and thinking, hmm, this sounds awfully nice and neat, it's, but, and, but we know it's not as simple as, it, as this. And you're right, it's generally much messier than this. But when you see or hear these kinds of things from people experiencing a change, it can be helpful just to know that this is all a normal part of the process. So if you're leading a change and you're noticing that people are angry, that's, that can be good news. If you've got angry people, you're already moving them along the curve. Sometimes that's hard to remember in the moment, but it can be helpful to know that these are, this is all a natural part of the process. So in a few minutes, we'll come back to this curve and talk about ways to help people at each part of the curve. So kind of hang on to this in your mind. We're going to come back to this in just a couple minutes. Before we do that, let's take a look at why people can react differently to change. If you've ever gone through change as part of a group, or if you've led a group through a change, you know that people respond to change in different ways. Sometimes the, these these different responses happen because of the circumstances, so things happening outside the person. And sometimes the different responses can be due to characteristics of individuals themselves. So let's look at this in a little more detail. Individuals' responses to change can depend on things outside themselves, such as the amount of input that, that they've had during the planning process. For example, if you've created a new website that connects job seekers with employers, but as you developed it, you only got input from one of the major employers in your area, you may get less cooperation from the, the employers who weren't as involved. Makes sense. Responses to change can also, though, depend on the level of understanding that each person has of both the need for the change and what can be expected as the process continues. So imagine that you've just been told your office is going to be moved to another building next month you're probably a lot more likely to be more comfortable with the change if you know the reason for the move and you kind of know what you can expect between now and when the move happens. You might be thinking it's sort of a no-brainer that, of course, people need to understand why a change is happening. But the fact is that we often assume people understand a lot more than they do. This is something to be especially aware of when, of when you are part of the group leading the change. It's very often, when we're really immersed in something on a hourly or daily basis and we've been thinking about it a lot and we've been working on it for a while, 
we often make the mistake of overestimating how much others really understand um, when they haven't been as involved as we have. So many change experts recommend doing what may feel to you like over-explaining to those who will be impacted by the change. And very often, when we get to the point that we feel like we just can't talk about it one more time, we're really just scratching the surface of what people need to help them really fully understand. And there are two more differences that on the surface feel like no-brainers, but there's more to them than meets the eye. One of these is the nature of the change. So the no-brainer part is that change tends to be less stressful if it's perceived by the other person as a minor change and is additive rather than subtractive. So the person is getting something of value rather than losing something of value. And when it's initiated by the person, him or herself, rather than something imposed upon them by, by an external entity. But, so yes, this all kind of seems like a no-brainer. But the, the more than meets the eye part is that word perceived. It's really all about the perception of the person. So what, what I might perceive as a minor change um, might actually be perceived by someone else as a major change. So it's all about the perception of the, of the individual, him or herself. And then there's the area of impact that the change will have. So let's, let's take a look at what, what I mean by this and what some potential areas of impact can be. In the 1980s, Noel Tishy, who is on the faculty at the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan, developed a way for classifying the types of impact that changes can have on any given person. And a lot of researchers have been kind of building on his theory since then. And it's, I have found it to be a really valuable tool for helping others while a change is in progress. So a lot of you are working to integrate behavioral health screening into primary care. Let's take that for an example and think a little bit about the impact this might have on a primary care provider or even a, an RN or a LPN or a medical assistant kind of new to these screenings and new to the field of behavioral health in general. When they first hear about a proposal to integrate behavioral health, um, they might be wondering about the technical aspects, the resources and knowledge. So do I know enough about behavioral health to really do this justice? Do I have the resources? Do I have the time to fit this in alongside all the other things that I do in a, in a day? Is this just one more thing I'm going to have to do hundreds of clicks in order to get done? Those are all about resources and knowledge. That's the technical aspect. They also might think about the political aspect, which is about their own power and influence. A, a provider might wonder if doing this type of screening means they no longer have control over any behavioral health-related discussions with the patient, if, the, if part of the process is to hand them off to somebody else. Or if there's someone who has a lot of experience in behavioral health but had no input on the screening form, their lack of input into the process may be a source of frustration for them. Those are all kind of political pieces. Am I going to am I going to lose some power in the during the course of this change? Am I going to lose my ability to influence the people, the processes, the outcome? They might also think about the cultural aspect. How does this process, how does the, the new process or the new, the, whatever the change is going to be, connect with their values? If, if their long-held mindset in this example is that behavioral health and physical health are two very separate things that need to be addressed separately by separate people, then this new process would go against that mindset, and, and you're up against a cultural impact um, as somebody working to drive this change. On the other hand, if, if an integrated approach fits with the view of the provider, they might have an easier time with it. And so you can have a pool of providers who will have very different reactions to the same change, um, and it can be due to all, all the differences across these areas of impact. We'll come back to this in a couple minutes, and we'll look at ways that you can address each of these areas of impact when you're thinking about strategies to help others through a change. So hang on to your change curve and hang on to your areas of impact, because we'll come back to those. Let's talk a little bit before we do that about differences in just characteristics of a person, him or herself. So I'm sure you're aware, as people who have a lot of change initiatives under your belt, 
that the reaction that someone has to a given change generally depends not only the circumstances surrounding that person, but also characteristics of the person, him or herself. Sometimes these reactions can be impacted by past experience with the topic. So they could have more or less experience, or they may have had a negative experience. Um, for example, so if you're working on building a community coalition and one of your stakeholders has been burned in the past by someone they were trying to collaborate with, that's, that's something that can um, pose a challenge. And the stakeholder can be coming into your project from the position of collaboration being a risk they're just not willing to take. They've had a negative experience with it in the past. There are also some underlying personality traits that lead to people being more or less comfortable with new experiences and comfortable with ambiguity, being more prone to anxiety than others. And in a minute, we'll talk about how to work with these differences, but, but there's one thing I want to point out before we move on, and that's the fundamental attribution error, which is on our, our caution tape across the slide. Um, the, the fundamental attribution error is a psychological principle that's supported by decades of research, and what we know is that human beings tend to attribute other people's behavior to who they are or their own personality traits rather than to the situation they're in. But we do the exact opposite when we're explaining our own behavior. So we explain our own behavior as generally being due to the situation rather than who we are. So for example, we're, we're changing software. Um, I, I might, and I'm, I'm opposed to it, I might explain that to myself, my opposition as, well, nobody asked for my input, so this, this software isn't really going to do what we need, so therefore I'm opposed to it. I'm explaining my behavior based on circumstances in the situation. On the other hand, if I'm driving a change in software and I've got someone who's really resistant to it, I might, I, I tend to explain, kind of attribute that resistance to personality traits. So my coworker just, boy, she just can't handle anything new. She's a change resistor. Um, this, is, this, is a, this is a tendency of us as human beings, the way that we kind of explain behavior of other people versus ourselves. So in the context of what we're talking about today, this means when we have people who may not be quite as excited about a proposed change as we are, we tend to jump first on attributing this lack of enthusiasm to, to a personal trait. So they're stubborn, they're just anxious about everything, rather than something in the environment. And if you're, if you're leading a change initiative, the good news is you have a lot of influence over the environment, over the way that people experience the change. Personality traits may play a role, but it's really a pretty small role. You just have to figure out how to set up the environment and help people with the things we've just talked about in a way that taps into what's important and right for them. The tough news is that this isn't easy, as I'm sure you all know. So given all this, what can we do to set up the environment in ways that help other people navigate the change process? Let's go back to our rider and elephant analogy for a minute. Remember that the rider represents logic and reason. The elephant represents emotions. And to help others with change, you've got to think about both the rider and the elephant. So the rider does the planning. The elephant provides the energy. We're going to look at some strategies for targeting both, but we're probably a bit more heavily weighted toward the elephant. Let's go back to our change curve and talk about some things you can do when individual people are at different spots on the change curve. When someone is stuck in denial, you might hear them say things like, this is never going to happen, this is just the flavor of the month, and maybe, maybe it's all eventually going to go away, or my needs are totally different than everyone else's, this just won't work for me. The first thing to do is to listen to what they're saying. Is it true that their needs are totally different? And if so, are there any adjustments you can make to accommodate the differences that they have? The flavor of the month comment is an interesting one. It, it can give you a little bit of insight into their past experience. Very often when you hear that, that means that the person has been disappointed by change efforts in the past. And it's really important to understand that that's what they're coming into the situation with as a history. But that being said, there's a couple things you can do when someone is stuck in denial. One is to have just a really honest conversation. This is, this is really happening, and here's why. 
In the network development group, some grantees struggle with a few folks who resist collaboration because they think the transition to value in healthcare really isn't going to happen. I just had this conversation in my family earlier this week, in fact. Um, that you know, some folks are still in denial, thinking things will eventually go back to the way they were. They've had to have some pretty candid conversations with these people to make the case for why the odds of that happening are pretty slim, and, and what the impact will be if the work isn't done to lay the groundwork for transition to value right now. Because people who are stuck in denial often don't have a good grasp of what the end goal will look like or have a good understanding of the reason for the change, it can also just be helpful to kind of reiterate this stuff. So why, why the change is being proposed, uh, the impact it might have on quality or whatever it is that the change is targeting, and to really clearly spell out the vision for what things will look like in the end. Sometimes anger can show up really overtly, so we may have raised voices, you may have angry facial expressions like this guy on the slide. Um, you may hear comments like, boy, do you realize how much work this is going to create for me, or there's no way we can do this in such a short time. But sometimes it can be more subtle, like not showing up for meetings, speaking negatively about the project to others outside the group. Um, we had someone earlier this week talking about um, potential sabotage by a member of the group, those, those all are pretty good indicators of anger. So either way, when someone is stuck here, you can, again, just have some honest conversations about um, where you acknowledge what's difficult. And again, because these should always be two-way conversations, listening to their point of view and making adjustments wherever you can. And then affirm your support, whether that involves giving them more time if that's possible or any other support that would be helpful. You'll see, again, communicate the vision is, is a strategy listed here. Sometimes people just get so bogged down in the details and kind of the minute-by-minute -minute challenges that it's really hard to keep the end goal in mind. So reminding them of why you're doing what you're doing, which could be providing services that currently aren't available in your area, improving patient care, improving access to care, whatever the end vision is, to be keeping that in front of people as often as possible. And it can also be helpful to ask others who do support what's happening to have conversations with somebody who's kind of stuck in anger and to share their perspective. As part of a collaborative group, it's not necessarily all on you. You don't have to be the only one working to influence others. You've got a, you've got a collaborative team. If you've got people in the bargaining phase, you'll hear things like, hmm, I could, I could have done this if, or if this change was made, I might be able to do it. This is, this is a really great sign that the person is moving along the curve. So take this as encouragement. And it's even possible you'll bypass the next stage on, stage on the curve, which is depression, and skip right to acceptance if you can adjust that plan. So if there's any way, if someone says, well, if, if this were the case, I could make this happen. And, you, and you've got the ability to make that happen, um, you, can, you can make things easier for everybody. Sometimes that's not possible, but whenever possible, see what you can do. Sometimes their bargaining chip is just a little bit more time or a couple more resources, and if that's doable, consider implementing any suggestions. So here we are at depression. People who are at this stage Really, their, their two primary needs are support and time to process. It can help for you, them to know that um, you know they're having a hard time and to let them know you're there to help in any way you can. Time is very often the remedy for folks who are stuck here. But don't lose sight of that trap door of despair. There's definitely a risk of people leaving at this point. So it's very important to be paying close attention and providing extra support if it's something that you don't want to happen. So then we've got acceptance. If you've got people who've reached this stage, just be, I'd warn you to be careful not to just check them off the list and move on. Because remember that we can slide back and forth on this curve. So it's important to keep checking in to see how things are going with, with folks, even when they're at the acceptance stage. Keep them engaged in the process. One really great way to keep them engaged is to get them involved with bringing others kind of along that curve. This is especially true if they've walked in the shoes of someone who's at an earlier stage along the curve. So if this person is a physician, for example, 
and they work through some of the same things that another physician who's still pretty angry is still struggling with, they may be able and willing to share their experience, their experience with the person who's still struggling. As we all know, sometimes the most powerful messages come from people who used to be where, where you are. Again, these examples are pretty simplified. And the way we experience change isn't always wrapped up in this nice, neat bow like this diagram shows, but it, but it is a valid illustration of kind of the big picture experience of change, and it can be a very helpful way to think about others who are going through change with you. So let's come back to the technical, political, cultural impact of change. Um, and there, there's a worksheet that goes along with this webinar down in the lower left corner of the screen um, that, that you can use to kind of think this through in a particular situation. So if you've got someone who's really stuck in an early stage of the change curve, take a look at this technical, political, cultural framework and, and think about where you think the sticking point is. Sometimes there's more than one, but, but think about the primary. Where do you think the primary sticking point is? So say you've got someone who's really angry and doesn't seem to be moving along the curve, it can be helpful to go back to this technical, political, cultural view of change and, and try to identify which is the sticking point. So if it's a technical issue where they're concerned they don't know enough or don't have the resources they'll need to successfully transition, you can do some of the things listed on this slide. You can provide education, make sure that they have the knowledge that they need um, to be successful in the new environment. You can um, provide additional resources, so making sure that time is allotted for them to learn and, and have the knowledge that they need. Be, be sure that you're listening to requests for resources and meeting those requests whenever possible and just being patient. Is it a political aspect where they have a lot of power or influence in the current state but have concerns about losing it when the change occurs? If so, you can be having some honest discussions about roles, responsibilities, and accountability um, in the new environment. And, and I would say one of the most critical things that you can do is if, if, there's, if there are concerns about losing power and influence, and that will, that will rarely be said out loud, so it's something that you have to interpret, is to make sure they understand the ways that they will continue to bring value and influence. This is one of the most critical things that people get in their job outside of a paycheck is having some influence and in making a difference in the world that they work in. And some of the strongest resistance to change comes when people feel that the new situation is going to reduce the power and influence that they have. So to really help them kind of think through how they will continue to bring value as an individual in the new situation. And then we've got the cultural area of impact, where there's a possible mismatch between their values or the way the things have always been done and the new way. And if that's the case, if you really feel like the, the cultural aspect is the critical sticking point for them, you can work to help them tie the existing values of the organization with their own individual values. You can help clarify the misalignment between the current state in the organization or in processes or whatever it is with the environment. So that, that really helps um, folks understand the need to do things differently when there's just not an alignment anymore between how we do things and what the environment is. When you identify um, the specific category of concerns or the specific category of resistance that people might have, not only can you identify some specific ways to help them, like, like is listed on this slide, but it also helps us feel a little bit more empathy for those impacted by the change, which can then impact our own feelings about that person, which can then help us build a stronger relationship and have more influence over how they're feeling about the change. So let's talk a little bit about personal characteristics. We looked at ways to um, help people at each part of the change curve. We looked at ways to help people given the technical, political, and cultural impact of change. Let's talk a little bit about personal characteristics. When people have less experience with a topic or a negative experience, they just generally need more support. 
so more time, a little bit more hand holding can help them feel more comfortable and like they have what they need um, to, to move forward. People who are less comfortable with ambiguity and tend toward being more anxious during change need just as much detail as you can possibly give them. The more information um, people with these characteristics have, the more comfortable they are. So sharing a really well-defined plan, making sure they clearly understand where you're going, where, where the, um, what's the end vision for the change, and then checking in with them really frequently to provide some direction, provide some detail, answer questions that they have, can really lower that anxiety and make them feel more comfortable. And there, as we talk about ways to help people um, along the change process, there's two, there are two things I'd like you to kind of keep in mind. One is that when we're immersed in something, we tend to develop the illusion that other people understand it as well as we do. So when you think about it, when you're responsible for implementing something new, you spend a lot of time gathering input and leading discussions, um, putting together some strategic goals and timelines, and bringing others into the loop when, when you're really already well along that change curve. We tend to forget that very often when we're kind of ready. We've done all the planning, and we're really ready to have that rubber meet the road. Other people are just getting used to the idea that something new is about to happen. So I encourage you just to have patience and empathy for other people and to use some of the strategies we've talked about today to help them through the process. The other one is something I've already said, but I just want to reiterate it because it plays such a major role in our own responses to others as we're leading them through change, and that's the fundamental attribution error. So the next time you find yourself thinking, oh, that so-and-so, there she goes again, she's just being her difficult self. Think of our tendency to attribute others' behavior to their difficult personality traits, and just remind yourself that there are probably some external factors at play that you could address and you could have some impact over. And speaking of thinking about how we're thinking about things, let's talk before we go about managing our own emotions during the change process. When you're leading a change, not only are you responsible for paying attention to other people's elephants, but you've really got your own to manage. The positive emotions we experience during leading a challenging project give us a lot of momentum toward our goal. So when we feel energized, for example, that means our rider and our elephant star aligned. Our emotions are kind of driving us in the direction our rational side is aiming for. When we feel frustrated, angry, or demoralized, though, it can be difficult to keep working toward that end vision. We tend to get sidetracked or stop moving altogether. Our elephant is kind of going off the path. And I'm sure you've all experienced some of this during your work on these grant projects, but you still reached your goals and made significant impact in the community. So I know you've all had success managing your own elephants, but I'm just going to share a couple tips that might be helpful the next time you feel your elephant moving away from the direction you'd like. So the first thing that you can do is to honor your elephant. That's just all that means is that you recognize when you're feeling frustrated or de-energized and recognizing it without judging yourself. Sometimes when you identify how you're feeling, you might be able to connect it to a spot on the change curve. So on those days when you're feeling demoralized, you've just run into one too many roadblocks, you can approach it the same way you would if you were helping somebody else experience the change and feeling the same way. So feeling demoralized may mean you're in the dip of depression on the curve. And what do we do when someone's in the dip of depression on the curve? We give them time and we express support. So on a demoralizing day, you can manage your own elephant by just acknowledging how you're feeling and giving yourself space to feel that way and gather yourself together. Um, Susan David is a faculty member in Harvard's medical school, and she's been doing a lot of research on emotional intelligence and what she calls emotional agility. And she's found that when we give ourselves permission to feel what we're feeling, the feeling actually goes away more quickly than if we fight it or try to keep it bottled up. So if you just let yourself feel disheartened a little bit <laughs> without judging yourself for it, you'll pretty quickly, again, regain your energy to, to keep on fighting the good fight and moving forward toward the change. And just like when you're thinking about other people who are stuck at a certain spot on the curve, when you're stuck, you can also think about the technical, political, and cultural side and how they're impacting you. 
are you are you unsure about what to do next because you need more knowledge? You just don't feel like you know what you need to know to move forward? That's the technical aspect. So this one's pretty straightforward. You do research, you learn from someone else, you ask questions to do whatever it takes to get the knowledge. Are you stuck because you're feeling like your values aren't aligned with your work on the project? For example, if it's really important to connect for you to connect with other people through your work, but you're finding yourself stuck behind a computer for eight hours a day, that's a misalignment of values. And if you can find a way to, to make changes that tap into what's important to you, you might find yourself moving farther along that curve. And then there are the times when we really get stuck. You know those days when you're just feeling sorry for yourself or you can't quite shake your anger or your frustration with a process or with a person. We've all had those days, and sometimes it may even be longer than a day, but, but what can you do then? When, when we're really feeling emotionally hooked by something that we just can't get past, Susan David says it's often due to the story that we've created for ourselves to explain the situation. So um, imagine that you are frustrated with your boss. You're feeling like your boss just really isn't supporting you. Sometimes we can get ourselves into sort of this negative cycle of thought so we kind of create this, this story. Um, it could be something like, my boss isn't supporting me because she's just power hungry. She likes to randomly exert power. This kind of a story can lead to some pretty strong emotional reactions in ourselves. And the problem is that we can't do a whole lot about that. If your boss really is power hungry, <laughs> there's not much you can do. But if you take a step back and you create one or more alternative stories, you might feel a little bit more empowered. So one possible alternative story about your boss in this example, it could be that she's not supporting you because you haven't really explained your position yet. Then maybe once she understands your position, you'll get more support from her. Or she's not supporting you because she's under a lot of pressure from her boss and her focus right now is somewhere else. So maybe just waiting until her workload is lightened up a little bit will give you a little bit of a window to, to have a, a discussion with her. So regardless of which of these is true, if you select an alternative story you can actually do something about, it can really change the way you feel about the situation and help you get your emotional elephant, your elephant more in line with your, your rational rider. And here's my final tip. And this is a concept that was commonly used in one of my previous companies that I worked when we talked about safety on the job and wellness initiatives. And this concept is rooted in a lot of key concepts in psychology related to how we see the impact that we have on our surroundings. So, so the idea goes like this. If you, if you roughly think that in any given situation, we control only about half of what happens to us. So like when we're driving, we can't control the weather, we can't control other, other drivers. But we do have control over whether we wear a seatbelt, we obey the speed limits, we pay attention. We control about 50%, roughly. When we focus on the things we can't control, like other drivers or tight deadlines or other people's personality traits, our elephant can, can sometimes get away from us and get us off of the path. The way to keep your elephant going in the right direction is to focus on that 50% that you do have control over. Like, taking the time to put your seatbelt on, or taking the time to really fully understand things, to, to check in with people, to see how they're doing. A lot of the other things that we've talked about today are the, are the part of the 50% that you do have control over. When you really are feeling like you're in a funk, take a minute and just ask yourself, what's my 50% here? And what are the things in this situation that I do have control over? And you'll be amazed at how this redirects your thinking and your emotions and can really get you back on track. It's really all about just getting those elephants going in the right direction, your elephants as well as other, other elephants. So that is an overview of strategies for leading through change. We've got some recommended resources for you here. Um, just a couple things I want to point out. Um, the switch book authored by Chip and Dan Heath is listed on this. That's, that's kind of takes the, the rider elephant analogy and it has some really good strategies for leading 
through change and working with emotions. I also just want to point out the podcast listed here in the middle. Um, Daniel Kahneman is a behavioral e economist, and he is not only incredibly knowledgeable and really innovative in his thinking, but he's really interesting to listen to. So if you ever have the opportunity to listen to